Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live broadcast from the e-learning hot seat. Uh, my name is Ladik, and we are, you know, we come to you from Open LMS. We come to you from the e-learn success series. But really, this is not about me. This is not about us. This is about my guests. And today, we have Dr. John Medina on the show with us today. Dr. John, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to call you John. Is that cool? Absolutely. Yeah, don't get <laughs> with the musician. <laughs> I have a better voice, though. <laughs> oh, nice, nice, nice. So, John, just because I mean, I mean, I know this, and you know, we were actually talking this for, for a few minutes in the green room there. Uh, sure. Tell us, everybody, tell everybody where are you sitting right now? Where am I? I'm in, I'm in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, my home base is at the University of Washington School of Medicine here in Seattle, Washington. So, I'm a Husky. The, uh, oh, nice. uh, as it were, and right now we're in the middle of an atmospheric river, which Stephen just suits me so fine. I can't stand it. I love to see the rain. I love to see the wind <laughs> and we have a big old storm. We're in a, I'm, I'm down in my basement. So kind of a bulletproof area. It's also actually somewhat soundproof. So you will, yeah. we won't interrupt our, our, our signal together as long as the ethernet holds out. I was just going to say, you never, you know, I'm sitting in Mexico city. So you never, you never know we're yeah. flying without a net here. Yeah. I will say this. I have to put, you know, we're, we're recording this on March 15th, 2022. Uh, and I want to remember anybody who's who's listening right now in either live or in the recording, you know, put a comment in the chat. You know, we're here to talk to you if, if you happen to be around. But, you know, something happened a few days ago that I don't know if you follow the National Football League, <laughs> but my Denver Broncos just took Russell Wilson. And oh, I got to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bobby Wagner's gone too. I mean, the, the entire uh, our our entire Super Bowl team has been dismantled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I got to say well, that it, it surprised me. Even though I I I I feel like I pay attention to the NFL, but it surprised me that that was even on the table. And then when it happened, I was like, "Well, this changes the story." So well, that's cool. there's been rumors that were flying back and forth, but that got particularly heavy in the last year. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like a super complete surprise. Uh, I was surprised that uh, that Denver was in the offing. I thought for sure. Well, I wasn't sure where he was going to go, but it, but mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, it, it seems strange to me. We were shooting for Deshaun Watson to come and replace, but he does not want to come to Seattle. So. I was just going to say, I saw, yeah, that that kind of looks yeah. like it has the gabosh as well. Oh, yeah, wow. but we 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 digress. I mean, I could talk football for a while, but <laughs> I we're going to talk I about brain, brain science. You know, <laughs> you wrote a book a while ago called Brain Rules. And now there's several editions. There's brain rules in the workplace. There's brain rules in academia. There's, there's brain rules everywhere, which is fantastic. But I want to tee us up like this. And I, you know, I told you this in Greener before, but I, I was actually watching you speak at Google a little while back. And I love what, you know, you put this on the table. I'm just, I'm going to make sure I, I do a quote here. Sure. At that talk, you said, the brain appears to be designed to solve problems related to surviving in an unstable environment no, related to surviving in yeah in an unstable environment outdoors, right? In constant motion, correct. Yep. And I'm just like you did. I want to repeat that. So the brain appears to be designed to solve problems related to surviving in an unstable environment outdoors, yeah. And in constant motion. How about that? So I'm going to start with one thing today. Okay. You and I are now, you know, talking through the Ethernet. We're talking to cameras. We're not in the same room. Neither of us are outdoors. Um, and this is how millions of learners are, ha you know, are, are working today. Yeah. Are we absolutely crazy or what? <laughs> well, we're, we're absolutely inefficient. Maybe that would be the way to say it. <laughs> because what you just described, I call the, uh, the design performance envelope of the human brain. The human brain really is designed to solve problems. It's not related to surviving. It's not interested in learning. It's interested in surviving. And it, used learning in, it uses learning in the service of that survival, but it, you can't flip it. So at every time when a survival instinct may be jeopardized or even thought to be mildly threatened, the brain goes into a completely different mode of learning because it's not interested in learning. It's interested in surviving. Hmm. Now, the conditions under which that occurs is an unstable meteorological environment and doing it in near constant motion in the great outdoors for sure. That just shows how much our evolutionary history is antithetical to our learning environments. I mean, if you were to design a learning environment that was directly opposed to what the brain is naturally good at doing, Stephen, you would design this space right now. The thing mm -hmm. that you and I are doing together, that's about as far away from how the brain actually is used to working in our hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary history. So we should be on treadmills at least, walking 1.2, 1.5 miles an hour, just to keep the blood from pooling into our butts and into our ankles. And yet that's not happening. You're seated, I'm seated. The, uh, so I had originally wrote brain rules because I really got 
tired of this confounder. Mm. I mean, if we're really interested in teaching people, shouldn't we think a little bit about how the brain works? Being as how it's not like you can teach things to your pancreas. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or things to your organ. So if the organ follows specific rules of engagement, you would ask the question, what are those rules of engagement? And would that then not also optimize the learning experience? The answer, it's a hypothesis, but I believe it's also a strong one because the answer is, yeah. Mm. So what, so we, now here we are 24 months after, day, well, ish, yeah, 24 months after, you know, the world declared, you know, shut down and, you know, we're starting to open up. Let me, op let me, let me just kind of put this on the table. Like, what have you learned? What have you observed? What, you know, what are the, one of the key, you know, maybe the key, key few things that people have been asking you or that you have learned from this, you know, learning in this pandemic environment? Probably the biggest thing I've learned wasn't anything new. It was more just like it got underscored. How ridiculously relational the human brain is mm. and how important in-person contact is to the human brain. Now, I know this is all about e-learning, and I totally get that there's an entire industry that is not only involved in it, but has probably saved some people's academic bacon simply because they can't get out of the house and, and, they're, and they're alive today. And I totally get that. Doesn't mean, doesn't give a rip about what the brain is interested in, what it's used to. Uh, a real good example might be Zoom phone calls. Maybe mm. a phone mm -hmm. call like this. Shall we pick on Zoom for a minute there? Would that be okay? Absolutely. I love, yeah. Like this, the, the Zoom phenomenon is great in itself. And now you can actually say, hey, let's Zoom. You know, let's, yeah. let's just like, let's Google that, you know? Sure. It's become a verb. It was a noun. It was a company. Mm -hmm. Then it became a noun. Now it's become a verb for sure. Okay. One fact that you can say to show, and we'll get back to the whole idea of how ridiculously relational we are in a second, but we'll go down this path for a second, I suppose. Um, Zoom phone calls make you tired. Mm -hmm. Now, we actually don't know why Zoom phone calls are exhausting, but they are. And the good counsel is to, if you have to do an hour's worth of Zoom, Stephen, when we're done with this phone call, you and I should both go do something that's not Zoom. <laughs> that's not a video conference. It's not Teams. That's not anything else. We should go do something else. It exhausts us. We think there are, we don't know why, but there are a couple of reasons that suggest eh, something plausible. I'll give three. Number one, the first one's called the big head problem or the mm -hmm. big face problem. Uh, the big face problem, the big head problem is just like right now. I see your face. You see mine. You see some of my shoulders down to, the, down to my mid-abdomen, and I can sort of see your shoulders and your big microphone. The only time in the Serengeti when we saw a big face or a big head was when we were about to have a physical assault with somebody or we were about to have sex. <laughs> Those were the times when we saw a big face. So the suggestion is, because in a Zoom phone call, you know there's not going to be a physical assault and there's probably not going to be any intimacy that would require in-person contact, that the brain has to call up these little batch files. <laughs> Am I showing my age by talking about <laughs> <laughs> just to say, do I pull that? Do I pull the floppy disk out? But no, I'm just like, these yeah. tiny little algorithms that actually can be repeated over and over again. Is that better for yeah. people not knowing what DOS is? And I don't blame you if you don't. We have these little files that have to come up and say, no, no, you're not having sex. No, 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 you're you're not going to fight somebody. No, 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 you're not having a reproduction. No, 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 you're not going to have a physical assault. And that gets exhausting. So the first mm. reason people think that Zoom meetings are exhausting is because of the big head problem and our need to constantly bat away our evolutionary history to have a conversation. Here's the second thought about why Zoom meetings are exhausting. It has to do with something you can measure actually really well, and that's eye contact. Mm. Eye contact is unbelievably important to social mammals. It's unbelievably important to gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees and dogs. Mm. It's important to human beings, too. And you can measure certain emotional reactions to eye contact simply by doing this. For example, if I am talking to you, Stephen, and then all of a sudden I break away after 1.2 seconds. Let's say I'm talking to the camera right now, but let, I'll talk now to your image on my, on, my, uh, on my computer. Here, now I'm talking to you. Right. But I'm actually not talking to you. I'm talking to an angle of you. Right. I no longer have your eye contact. Now, there I am. Oh, I'm back. If that's gone for 1.2 seconds or more, you think I'm ignoring you. I was just going to say, you get, you get uncomfortable. You, you know, you feel a little, you feel a little strange when somebody, especially when you, when you talk with somebody and it's clear that they're, you know, their camera's over here and they're talking to you or they're talking to their screen over here. You just, you're like, Hey, wait, I'm, I'm right here, right here. If you want to do a parlor trick sometime uh, to show the uncomfortable, I would, I, I've done this in lecture before. I teach mostly bioengineering graduate students, by the way. Um, I'll have them say, don't look at my eyes when you're talking to me. Look at my hairline. 
Mm. And I'm going to look at your hairline too. So it's just off. So it's just off a little bit like this. It gives people a really creepy feeling because you don't have the eye contact. We need 1.2 seconds or more. But there is a Goldilocks here, Stephen. If I give you a steady gaze for more than 3.2 seconds, I'm about to do that right now. Watch. You think there's something wrong. <laughs> you think you, in fact, if I'm gazing at you with not saying anything with some intensity, you might get actually creeped out. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that human gazes are extraordinarily important for social information. And not just with us non-human, uh, not just with us human primates, but non-human primates and dogs. And there's lots of animals that require eye contact. In a Zoom phone call, <laughs> you could be one of a Brady Bunch filled of squares, Hollywood squares inside a call where you're doing nothing but doing this and staring and silent. Mm -hmm. That can be a little creepy. At any rate, the brain's not used to it. So the second reason why it's exhausting, we have to bring up that same batch file. No, he doesn't have good camera etiquette. That's why his eyes are down here. But he still trying to talk to me. <laughs> That's right. a batch that's something, and if you're staring for too a long a period of time, the brain goes, "Yeah, jeez." So there's a big head. You got eye contact issues. I can just hear the brain. You know, it's only two percent of our body weight, but it's twenty percent of our metabolizable glucose. It sucks up. Yeah. Brain, uh, uh, uh. But there's a third reason, <clears throat> which I think probably is the strongest of all. That has to do with nonverbal body column communication. You can't see my body column. You can mm -hmm. see my chest. You can see my face. I can't see your body column. I have no idea how to extract information, social information, about what you're feeling right now, Stephen, because I mm. can't see the whole you. I can see part of you. I can see a very important part of you, your face and whatever. I've tried to, when I give distance lectures, to, I have done sometimes, we had to do that, of course, in the COVID times. That's why I almost always wear a dark shirt. And when I wear a dark shirt, I then make sure that my hands are visible so that there's a high contrast so they can actually see some of my, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist. So uh, I, I lecture with my hands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Of course. That's that allows us to see something beyond the body column. If I could really do it, I'd be standing up and moving and blocking and going back and forth. Oh, we don't have any of that information either. What you can show is that the brain will sometimes then make it up. It doesn't know what you're feeling. So it's just going to have to make it up. Oh, he's got a frown. But I don't know if he's got a frown because he's about to clear his throat or because there's something else going on. Mm -hmm. I can't see also, uh, the brain is so sensitive to that form of information, any of the nonverbal contact, that even it can even detect changes in micropressure, in air pressure between two people that are talking. Mm -hmm. Another experiment you can do, if you know what an interval is between a one and a two, just do a, 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 a second as opposed to like a perfect fifth, do a two, and just buzz, and you can feel the, the, the air vibrate between two people. Your brain is sensitive enough to pick it up. In a Zoom call, <laughs> I can't detect your air pressure. I don't even know if you're breathing air. Right. <laughs> so I can't detect any pressure that's going on between us. So I can't know when you're about to interrupt me. And I need to stay silent so that you can have your say. I've been monologuing here, what, for the last maybe one minute, one minute, 30 seconds. And I can't know if you're starting to inspire because you want to say something or if you're just busy being polite or maybe I'm boring you. All that information is lost to me. So you got the big head problem. You got eye contact problem. You got body column and nonverbal problems. You've got an exhaustion for God's sakes. When you have a Zoom phone call after one hour, get off and go jump on a trampoline or something. How, how do we, so I, I have two questions that come from that. One, what are there ways to counteract these three phenomena in, you know, maybe not counteract, but at least, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, do, do, yeah, yeah. Mitigate them, right. Mitigate them in some way. And then two, you know, I know that you and I, in, in a previous, you know, sort of a warm up call, you, you know, you had put together an actual schedule for what, you know, like an, what an ideal schedule would look like, which I know no one. Zero. I know exactly zero people who do that schedule, but I'd, I'd really like to hear what is the, you know, wh what would you say so that we optimize how our virtual days go now? Yeah. Well, this would be true, not for the virtual world, although I think you can make a, a logical extrapolation. The stuff I'm about to describe would be Kleitman's what's called a BRAC, basic rest activity cycle. This was not done in this environment. So we have to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can extrapolate uh, what you can show 
is that uh, uh, Nathaniel Kleitman was actually mostly interested in sleep. He did sleep research and he showed a lot of the cycles that go on at night and there's he's a big big time study of REM and REM sleep. But he also started looking at cycles that occurred during the day because he noticed that the brain seemed to be following oscillations, not just at night, but also mm -hmm. during the day. So he started to study them and he came up with something called the BRAC, the basic rest activity cycle. He found that every 90 minutes, you need to take a break from whatever the heck you're doing. Mm. So it's too long a stream. You can show that your attention begins to wane. In a practical setting, he showed that, uh, and others than apologists for him, were able to show that during shift work, if you don't give somebody a break in 90 minutes, their error rate, their mistake rates go way, way high. Mm. But if you then give them like a 10, 15 minute break at, at, at the 90 minute mark, and then have them recycle back to work, their mistake rates go back down to baseline. So you actually have a set of improvements. You can make, I think, a logical extension that you need a break from whatever stream of information that is occurring on a regular basis every 60 to 90 minutes easy. Mm. Um, it would be an extrapolation to this very good work that was actually shown. Um, one of the ways that I can really see this, because I'm associated with a medical school, we see these emergency rooms and they've been clobbering uh, uh, our poor residents forever and ever, where you don't get 90 minute breaks and their error rates just increase. Everybody's does simply because they've been working for too long. And I've suggested we've worked with some architecture firms here in the Seattle area, one in particular, NBBJ, to design the emergency room of the future, which could be a, a substitute for the workplace of the future, just in general. You know what you need to do after 90 minutes? If you've been in the ER and you've had nothing but code your entire time and you've had two people die on your shift, you know what you need? You need a big door with a big sign that says this way out. And you open up that door and here is this Japanese garden mm. with a waterfall and a big chair that says sit here mm -hmm. for 10 minutes. You can show that if you could re-expose somebody to the natural environment within 200 milliseconds, the nervous system of the human body begins to respond in a positive direction. It begins to detach, it begins to disengage. And after 10, 15 minutes of that disengagement, you have begun to, I'm gonna use the word restore, I'm not sure that that's the right word. It, I, maybe a better way to say fuel up the tank partially so mm. that you can go back in and then do more of your stuff. Uh, this is very much in line with what Kleitman said about the BRAC, whatever. But if now we add the natural environment, notice, Stephen, we've just gone back to our very first sentence in our conversation. The human brain appears to have been designed to solve problems related to surviving in an outdoor setting. Right. That was quite honestly, when I when I heard it in your talk, that was the one variable or the piece that really, you know, like it really caught my brain and, and threw me out with because we spend so much time, you know, in our offices, in, in our, in our houses, you know, in our car, like, you know, in places that are not natural settings. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if, you know, the, 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 obviously there's many people out there who have been waving the flag for a very long time that we need more nature in our lives, et cetera. But this is definitive. Yeah. Well, it's not an opinion. <laughs> 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 As a scientist, I've long since carry what I believe. I just would like to know what's out there. And if nature didn't wasn't restorative, I couldn't say that. And so I'd say, well, Steve Gellert and all the other people that worked on this at the University of Michigan for years, uh, uh, sorry, you know, if you didn't do any experiments, I can't show that to you. But you can actually measure autonomic responses, parasympathetic, sympathetic interactions. You need, a, in fact, you need a specific type of outdoor. It's better if it's green. 523 nanometers or above in wavelength. It's better if it's green. And it's better if there's, you get an amplifying effect if you can add running water to it. Why? Why running water? Oh, because it just makes, I mean, it makes sense. Like just in my brain, in my gut, like I'm, I knew you were going to be like, okay. And if you could have a stream, you know, <laughs> like that, that's going to make it better, but. Well, let's, let's get into it. Sure. There is a reason why it's not just it's not just a, a, a plant, but a specific wavelength of plant and running water as a force multiplier. Um, in our sojourn in the Serengeti and the sides of the Ngorongoro crater, that's a savanna. But it didn't used to be a savanna. Years and years and years and years and years and years ago, it wasn't a savanna. It was a rainforest. It's still mm -hmm. a rainforest in the central part of Africa. But beginning about, you know, there's some controversy about this, but let's just say a long time ago. Uh, maybe half a million years ago, maybe there's there's uh, uh, there's a lot of slop here, but there's not a, slop, a lot of slop about this. 
our birthplace, our uterus, our Serengeti, our Africa began to dry out mm. and to aridify. It's still doing that. The Sahara is still moving south. So we had to come out of our beautiful, lush, green rainforest filled with water. And now we were on the savannah. So when we look around on the savannah, what is going to give us a yippee? What is going to give us a calming effect about survival? Well, two things, Mike. Number one, if you could see a beautiful green plant, you don't see a lot of green plants out in the savanna. You see a lot of savanna out in the savanna. But if there's this beautiful green plant, that suggests something. Oh, there's a photosynthesis event going on. I'll bet by God there's water underneath it. Mm -hmm. Because the biggie is you're going to dry out in the savannah, so you want to be folk with water. It makes perfect sense that if you then could hear running water, you would say to yourself, oh, this isn't just green. This is a green with water so exposed that even when it's evaporating, you know, there's a lot of water. So it makes perfect sense to this scientist in our evolutionary psychology stripes to look at that and say, well, of course, a natural environment is going to give you certain reassurance, but it would be specific components of the natural environment, not just the natural environment itself, but specific elements within it that would provide the calming effect. That produced a bed, uh, a, a, a bedding, if you will, mm -hmm. for a whole series of research projects that have really uh, pushed this out in spades. In, in Britain, it's called uh, 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 ecological walking, sometimes called green exercise. In Japan, the University of Kyoto, they call it forest bathing. Forest? Oh, I like Isn't that. They're great. Yeah. 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 So what are you going to take a, an ecological walk in the. In the but green? I mean, but you think is, you know, when I think of Jap like the Japanese garden, I mean, that's a thing. That's a real thing. Like, and, and this. Was that based on research or was that just, you know, I mean, was that, I, I guess, is your research now just proving like the, the you know, the, the need for these harmonious spaces and the connection with nature sure. that, you know, they really go around to something? Yeah. Well, once you have the initial find, it's not my research. It is, it is, it is. Sorry. Right mm -hmm. UK and, 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 and two UKs, University of Kyoto and, and United Kingdom. The, uh, um, once the original result was found that within 200 milliseconds, there was something happening to the nervous system. The second tier of questions was, well, what are the elements that can produce the event? What are the things that produce a calming effect? What are the things that induce learning? And from that, where a whole slew of research is being found, some of it is extraordinary. Urban settings are awful. Turns out we hate 90 degree angles. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, because they're sharp. When do you see a 90 degree angle? Oh, I don't know. When there's a bunch of obsidian rock near a volcano in oh. the Serengeti, sometime where it's going to tear. You know, we are this soft pink little tissue. Right. So anything that could be could, that could puncture us would often be a death sentence in the hunter gatherer cruel world mm -hmm. in which we resided. So it would make perfect sense. Here's another one blue light, 490 nanometers or so and above, stimulates you. It does. In fact, you should not look at 490 nanometers and above. You should not look at blue light mm. uh, about two hours before you go to bed because your, your brain gets aroused by it. Something you could show. Now, why would it be blue light that does that? Well, the answer once again comes from the Serengeti. When was the time that we saw the color blue? Well, when it was daytime. Sure. I was just thinking like a giant blue sky, you know. Yeah. And before it's blue, that means it's either dusk or it's dawn. But in either event, you're coming out of a sleep environment. Blue is going to be the signal to, you know, bring out the Disney birds and let's let's all have a, you know, a morning party because it's time to get up. Mm. The interesting thing about that also is that we we probably have natural clocks in here that gauge not only when there's blue light so that whenever we see blue light, we are aroused. When the blue light begins to go away, that's the time to start settling down. Mm -hmm. Time to start getting rid of certain things because in the nighttime we are not a nocturnal predator. We're not. A, we were a predator. <laughs> we sure. were kind of this weird in between state where we could do some things. We learned to take over the world because we survived by cooperation. But at nighttime we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to a raccoon for heaven's sakes at night. Mm -hmm. We're certainly vulnerable to the nocturnal animals, the leopards of the world, and maybe other animals that do their hunting at night. So we had to get out of Dodge. We had to go someplace else. So blue not only was an arousal, lack of blue was a safety issue. Mm. I want to circle back to the 90-minute clause that you, you know, you were just saying, if we're, you know, if you're paying attention, if you're engaged for 90 minutes on, in your work or whatever, that you need to take a break. Juxtapose that for me with the work and the theories around flow. 
about, you know, and, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of people over the last, at least that I've read five, 10 years, and maybe it's 90 minutes, but, you know, chunking your work where it's yeah. like, look, you know, get yourself into a block of time where you can just really dive in. And especially if you can achieve that flow state, yeah. does that, does that, does that tear apart or, or extend that 90 minute window or how, where did those connect? Well, I have a hard time. Uh, Mikhail Chik said me higher, the guy who actually did the uh, the Hungarian American uh, mm -hmm. who did the work on flow. I'll just have to be honest here. I don't know what flow is. Okay. To uh, I'm now remember I'm a developmental molecular biologist. I'm a biochemist, so I uh, I have a pretty strict uh, uh, requirement for things that can flow from the biochemistry flow from the biochemistry into the behavior. And the distance between biochemistry and behavior is a big old deal. I do like the word better, cognitive disinhibition, because it's mm. something you can actually measure better than flow. Flow is usually defined as a creative state, and one of its biggest hallmark features is, is that you lose track of time. Right. And that's fine. I've been in that. I'm sure you have too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but exactly what that means, and are you more creative in that space, I think that's an open question. Mm -hmm. But... You can say some things. This is Shelley Carson's work at Harvard, uh, uh, something called cognitive disinhibition. And then also some other work about divergent, convergent creativity. Shall we talk about creativity for a minute? I, I would love. I would, yeah, let's let's talk about creativity. Let's, let's go there for sure. OK, well, let's, there are two models. Let's do the second model first <laughs> because it will explain better Shelley's work, I think, which was probably has more empirical support. OK, we think of creativity. We think of since we don't know what it is, there are about 60 definitions about what it is. It's almost always defined functionally, and that is a novel idea that has use. Because my research interests are, are the genetics of psychiatric disorders, I meet all kinds of people all day long whom you might call really, really creative. They also hallucinate a lot and bang their heads up against the wall and they do all kinds of things that are aberrant. You wouldn't call it creative because mm -hmm. it doesn't have a utility associated with it. So that's, that's the operating definition that most of us use. Okay. With that in mind, there are two types of creativity. There is something called divergent thinking, which is something you can measure. The archetypal example of divergent thinking is, um, think of new uses for a brick. I'll sometimes say that in lecture. Uh, class, think of new uses for a brick. And uh, somebody will say, oh, doorstop. Mm -hmm. Or somebody will say a paperweight and whatnot. And if you give those kinds of answers, um, you score really low. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's not all that far away from a brick, right? A brick is mm -hmm. a solid mass, and it's used to as a support structure. Uh, but here's one that'll that'll just put it off the charts. It's a famous answer. It was done by I, th I think a, a little girl. I would grind the brick into dust and use it as paint. Woo. How about that? Yeah. See how that diverges? That's real. So you might call that creativity, but you can show that there is a divergence of things. Okay, so that's one type of creativity. If, to be have divergent creativity, uh, if flow, I guess you might call that, but divergent you can measure, uh, you can't be very stressed. You have to be able to be within your 90-minute zone and just getting all that stuff. Okay, there's a second type of creativity in this view before we get to Shelley's work that's called convergent creativity which is also a form of creativity, is also something you can measure, but it's the exact opposite of divergent. Whereas divergent, you might think of as a spotlight. Convergent is a, creativity is like a magnifying glass that actually focuses. It converges you on a point. Hmm. Uh, the, the best example I can think of for convergent evolution or convergent creativity, have you seen the movie Apollo 13 way, way back when with Tom Hanks? Tom oh, Hanks, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh -huh. That movie, Stephen, is a celebration of convergent creativity because they're doing all kinds of creative stuff, but they have one goal in mind to get the people safely back to earth. Mm -hmm. So rather than being like a sparkler, finding new use, uses for a brick, it's actually focusing you so that you can focus down on a particular problem. Both are. I, yeah. I remember in that particular instance, there was a really finite set of options and variables. And so how do we put these together to achieve that goal? Right. Right. They, they had things like duct tape and, of course, and uh, all kinds of... MacGyver was not involved. <laughs> <laughs> I, re yeah. I remember them trying to make a carbon scrubber, and I don't remember what they... But they could only use, you know, essentially uh, uh, scissors and paste. And But they made one, and it actually worked. That's a great form of convergent creativity. Okay, so that's one form. I'm not sure where flow fits in there, but these two things you can actually measure in the laboratory. Now here's something else you can measure, and it's a different series of ideas. This comes from Shelley Carson's work called cognitive disinhibition. Okay. 
Okay, it's it's a great term, although it seems a little awkward to say, but you are disinhibited. You are cognitively disinhibited. You can think of oh, just about anything. The metaphor I sometimes use when I'm talking about it in lecture. In the movie, I haven't seen the new West Side Story version, but I have seen the old West Side Story version. Mm -hmm. version. And in it, they have a dance scene. It's taking place in a dance with the idea of the two gangs trying to reconcile with each other. Sure. And what's wonderful about the music is that you've got the big band of Leonard Bernstein on one spot with a mambo, which Leonard Bernstein also wrote on the other. And they are a class clash, not just of musical styles, but of social culture, which was mm -hmm. the point. And there's this cacophony. And there's a point where it just gets all oh, cacophonous, cacophonous, cacophonous. And then something magic happens. The two protagonists, the the two, the male and female, Natalie Wood two and Richard spotlights Ray. come down. Yeah, the two spotlights. Yeah, come in. yeah. Thing causes up. They turn the music down. That's kind of important because what you're going to replace it with. They then come together and do this almost like a waltz type thing. Focus, focus, focus. This is a perfect metaphor for Shelley Carson's ideas about creativity. Mm. What, what in, in the beginning when you need to solve a problem. You want to be as cognitively disinhibited as possible. So you want the dance floor with mambo and big band and let's get some hip hop in there and maybe some Aerosmith and maybe some Billie Eilish. And, I mean, just throw it all in together with this gigantic stew of stuff. But if you see two commonalities, you have a powerful ability to tune out everything else for just a short period of time and just look at the two variables, like the two leads, like Richard Bamer and Natalie Wood, where was the equivalent of that in Steven Spielberg's uh, movie, so that you can then, then if you want, you can lens back out and see this cacophony and go back and forth. This ability to go back and forth between the two produces some of the best problem solving that exists. And there, it's interesting. Hmm. Cognitive disinhibition really is, you want to be as stress sensitive as you can, but in order for you to solve a problem so that you tune out everything else and just go. Sometimes it's good to have a little bit of stress. Apollo 13, sure. stress, you know, you needed to get it done. So there's a whole lot in there that has nothing to do with flow. And boy, are you a patient listener. You just push my batch file there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> utterly fascinated here. I, I, I could, I could listen to this for, I mean, this is just my personality, but I could listen to this for hours just because, you know, I, what I love about these conversations as well is that we, I, you know, everybody who's listening right now, they connect it to something that's happened in their life or how they, you know, how they operate or whatever. And I'm just, I'm sure. thinking of those times when, you know, what I, what I really love are those times when you either find yourself unexpectedly in a stressful situation, especially like with a business problem or a school problem or something like that. And you're not quite sure what to do. And one of the best things that I've always done is you just throw everything on the table and you start sorting through it. And then like magic starts to happen, right? You start to come up with the time. I mean, this is a classic or I mean, to a brainstorming session, right? And you start, you know, you just sort of nothing, nothing is held back, but then something sort of comes out. And I love that somebody gave it a name and also can measure it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you can show it in the laboratory. In fact, there's a business application for this too, which has been done by Bob Epstein a long, long time ago whereby he's asking the question, can groups sol be creatively solve a problem? Say that if you give them a divergent thinking task, can mm -hmm. they eventually come up with the brick as paint idea? Here's what he did, which is interesting because it shows the tension between having a bunch and then having a solitary moment, just like the West Side Story does. Um, the experiment that he did was he had a whole bunch of, a group of people, say 15 or 20 at a time, and he randomized and blinded these trials. So this is good work. The uh, uh, um, Ask the question, okay, I'm going to give you a problem. you got 15 minutes to solve it. Go. <laughs> how many do you come up with if you just do a brute force, whatever? And then he measured that, measured how many solutions to the problem. He then took a second group that did it and did an extraordinary thing. He allowed the big group only to interact for five minutes. Mm. Then everybody in the group had to scatter to the hills and cogitate by themselves for an additional five minutes. And then at the end of that five minutes, got them all back together. And then they started to have this gigantic conversation. And what he was able to show is that that group that was staggered, where you had group and then isolation and then group again, came up with three times more mm. solutions to the problem than ones that had just had been brute forcing it for 15 minutes. So there appears to be a commonality between this idea of, 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 of group interactions and then isolation. They may sound like they're in tension with each other, but they have echoes of things you can actually measure in the laboratory. Mm, I love it. I feel like there was a third thing you and I had, had had teed up to talk about that I want to make sure that we get to, but remind yeah. me what it is because I'm I'm feeling a little embarrassed that I 
it's completely <laughs> lost it. I've been so fascinated by creativity and chunking and all this other stuff. So what, what, what was it? Well, let's continue on with the creativity for a second, because the next one I think that we talked about in our conversation previous is a downer. It's grief. That's what I, okay. That's what I thought it was. But then I was like, is that right? I can't, because <laughs> I knew there was something about death and grief that we had talked about, but I couldn't remember. Okay. Well, let's continue on with the creativity thing about, and then you can get to the, um, uh, the sadder, but equally important. I totally get, we should talk about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. Sure. Uh, given we're close to a million deaths now with COVID. Mm -hmm. The, uh, um, Okay, but let's well, have one more confounder, or not a confounder, but a, a variable to get in with creativity. Nathaniel Kleitman, the guy who did the basic rest activity cycle, as I mentioned, was really into uh, sleep and asking questions about sleep. So was another guy by the name of Robert Stickgold, for whole different reasons, asking questions about why do we need to sleep? And this is a really interesting uh, question to ask here because a sleep turns out to not to be bioenergetically very uh, restorative. In fact, the brain is more rhythmically active at night than it is during the day with these gigantic swaths of eventually getting down to what we call delta sleep and then up through uh, non-REM, one, two, three, four, and then up to a REM. You, all, you, you go up and down like this four or five times a night. And during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, which, by the way, we have no idea why there's rapid eye movement. <laughs> Why do you why do you have REM sleep? I have no idea. Why is the sky blue? I mean, we just don't know. Uh, um, uh, so you come up for air and then go back down. Uh, was able to show something really interesting. If the question about why we need to sleep isn't bioenergetically uh, uh, available as an answer, why do we sleep? Turns out he may have the answer. And it came from studying from rats. And I'm going to uh, kind of conflate both the rat and human data together because they all kind of work together here. What happens at night, Stephen? When you go to bed, your brain at a certain part in the sleep cycle begins actively replaying everything it experienced that day thousands of times. Wow. Over and over and over again. In fact, it will repeat thousands of times, and then it will begin starting to select, almost like it was taking uh, food off of a grocery shelf, other things that happened a couple days ago, and maybe a week ago, and who knows, maybe five years ago. You, you're starting to put, you're beginning to process all of the information that you had available to you during the day at night, and it all of a sudden dawned on him. We don't need to sleep for restoration. All we need to do is to sleep is to cut off all the sensory inputs because we need to focus on what happens in here. We don't need to sleep so that we can rest. We need to sleep so you can learn. And with that, I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry. That, that, that blows me away because <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wait, what a second. Wait, we, we sleep to learn. Okay. Bring up, unpack that. And if you don't get very much sleep, you're not going to get a whole lot of learning. Hmm. So powerful is this? This this actually has an antecedent in the behavioral world. He was able to show it with in <laughs> using a lot of deep field electrodes. And like I say, originally with mice, uh, we now know the areas of the brain that actually get turned on when this occurs. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, so you're replaying it. Was able to show this. Um, I'm not sure of the specifics of this, but I know one experiment of the published work, but I know one experiment that was said. So I'll just say it this way. Um, um, took a bunch of math graduate students and gave them some math problem to solve, like, I don't know, some differential equation, some math. The, and, and the researchers also gave these poor graduate students uh, a bonehead way to solve these problems. You know, unbeknownst to these wonderful graduate students, there was an elegant, beautiful way to solve these math problems. Hmm. But they didn't tell them what that way was. In fact, the measure, as you might suspect, they wanted to figure how many spontaneously got the new way on their own. Okay, so here's the experiment. We're going to let them go for eight hours on this thing. So you're going to have the whole day to try and to try and solve these equations. That's group A. Group B is also going to get eight hours TOT, time on task. But inserted into that is going to be a good night's sleep. So mm. they might get at it for four hours, but then they had to sleep on it. And then they had to get up again and then solve it again. The question that of these research where it was asked by these researchers, who got the most? The answer is extraordinary. If you just worked on it all day long, about 20% of the group gets the new, fast, elegant way to do it. But if you had a chance to sleep on it, that number goes up to 60%. Wow. Got the new way.
showing that the brain was not only repeating what it was learning during the of the day during during night it was actively processing what it mm. had learned mm. during the night and so when you wake up your eureka boo so it all of a sudden shows if you have a problem you're stuck on and by the way this has also been shown empirically the, the best thing you can do before you go to bed is to get out a pencil and a piece of paper and make a drawing if you can doesn't matter if you're an artist or not make a drawing if you can of the problem itself then put the paper away and go to sleep then when you wake up after you've done your morning toilet go right back to that paper and get started solving the problem you'll you'll get much better at it wow showing the ability to harness the things the brain is naturally good at doing yeah in a way that can bring into our lifestyle and so that's also a very powerful way to look at sleep now there is a confounder to some of these data that we have to look at it depends upon lots of things to get this optimal work but one of them is have you heard of the concept of chronotype do you know what that is you heard that before sounds something to do with time i don't know but i've never heard of it before yeah yeah well very good yeah <laughs> chrono and type so, so so something about time inside us uh turns out to be the case um it turns out that when you take your sleep turns out to be as important as that you get your sleep hmm. okay which is why this is it's a confounder not a confounder i guess would be a, a variable that take into consideration. About 20% of the population, if they had their druthers, if you could disengage from life and just sleep like you naturally, like you were genetically wired to, about 20% of the population, one in five, are what we call early chronotypes. They typically will wake up at 6.30 in the morning, and they will typically not want to go to bed until about 9.30 at night. Hmm. They will report that their most productive times are in the morning. You know, and if we measure them, by golly, that's about right. If they are in the morning, in fact, it's noon is the peak, so they're accelerating up into the noon hour. Okay, about one in five of the population is is like that. We call them early chronotypes. If you want to ever Google this or Bing this, they're also called larks. Okay. Okay. I, I think I'm interested to hear what the other ones are because I've already put myself in the lark bucket. So let's go. <laughs> well, you then, Stephen, are the sworn enemy. <laughs> okay. Probably of my wife, but that's okay. 20% of the population or so, about one in five of us, if they had their druthers, would not go to bed until three o'clock in the morning mm. and would not get up until 11 o'clock the next morning. They will report that their most productive times are at night, typically mm -hmm. between 9 and 12 at, and midnight and then kind of sort of decelerating. And they're absolutely right. We call them late chronotypes okay. or owls. No, not surprising there. And it makes perfect sense to me if that's one in five, the rest are on a continuum. And by the way, the, the middles are sometimes called hummingbirds and I have no idea. <laughs> it's living proof that scientists really need to take an English course. But they're hummingbirds. So. <laughs> so they're hummingbirds. So we have a school system. You know, what's really funny is that we have early chronotype students, for sure. It may be genetically wired. There's strong evidence that suggests it does. And if that's the case, you could no longer, you could no more change that habit of yours than you could change your eye color. Mm. <laughs> if it's that deeply welded into us, you've got 20% of the population that are early chronotypes. And that's true with students. It's true with teachers. In the school of the future, in the business of the future, why don't you match them? Right, absolutely. During the most productive times, if you're going to bust up the concept of office anyway, which is what's happening with this COVID uh, business, then the late chronotypes should also have the same grace uh, given to them. You would have the late chronotype uh, 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 executives matched to the late chronotype uh, non-executives, and two of them will work together. Would that not increase their productivity? The answer is probably. Mm -hmm. And given that sleep is so extraordinarily important to the learning process, when you take your sleep is a powerful productivity argument, just like how much sleep you get is a productivity argument. Wow. I'm, I am i don't even know what to do with all this data that we've like, I mean, we're 45 minutes in and it's just, and now I, I, I we have to go to the, the sad grief. topic, the grief topic, because as you and I discussed before, one of the obviously most powerful outcomes of the last 24 months is we're all connected to death and it very, 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 very much for most of us immediately, right? There have been many, many people who've been touched in their immediate family, but it's hard to find anyone who has not been touched by the pandemic in this way. And so that's affected businesses, but it's affected the learning environment, our, you know, our, our ability to show up and those kinds of things. So, so take me there. Yeah. Well, okay. 
I guess we'll end on the sad note. The uh, no, because right? we had to, we're going to end with what's the perfect schedule? Because oh, we no. haven't talked about the perfect schedule yet. I like that better. <laughs> We should talk about grief for sure, because in our culture does not deal well with death. Mm -hmm. We live in a culture that has never been overrun by uh, a foreign power, for example. Imagine the, one of the horrific scenes of looking at Ukraine and busy being assaulted is that is just that. This is now a culture <laughs> which has been run over throughout its entire history. We don't have anything like that around here. Uh, mm -hmm. So we deal with death in a more sanitized version. And so it's uh, uh, in fact, we don't we don't don't even say the word death. We say that he has passed. She sure. has passed. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. I love euphemisms to soften the blow if you're not used to it. But last year, New York Times said that one in three uh, in the United States have been directly affected by a death from COVID. And it's much more now because, like I said, we're approaching a million at the, as as of this recording, a million deaths and, and mm -hmm. counting. Um, uh, here's an interesting statistic. And then we'll talk about grief and the brain science of it. The, uh, about 20, before COVID, about 25% of the workforce was already dealing with what is sometimes called primary grief. So grief was already a thing way before COVID. I don't know what the numbers are going to be. I wouldn't trust any longitudinal that's coming out right now anyway, but it's going to be much larger than 25%, I have a feeling. So grief is going to be a big deal. So what do we know about grief? For this, we'll go to the great work of George Bonanno. That's literally his name. He's at Columbia. The, uh, uh, there are others. He sounds like a mafia dog. Don't kill me, George. <laughs> oh, no, I'm Medina. It's Spanish. You're Bonanno. It's Italian. The, uh, um, uh, but he has studied grief in a very responsible way. And one of the things you can say about not only his work but others is that we have to do some myth busting before we can talk about what to do and how to I, uh, generalize your work day. Here's the myth busting. Throw out everything you know about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. There is absolutely no empirical support for it. You might be oh. familiar with uh, with the, with her work originally. You start out with denial, you go to anger, then you go to bargaining, and then I think there's depression, and then there's acceptance, as if it was a march step uh, through. Uh, that has absolutely no empirical support. That's just Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's comment on how others that she observed went through grief. Mm -hmm. If you do it more responsibly, if you then make it a research effort, and there is now a whole science of bereavement out there that you can study, uh, George is leading the pack in, in, in one of these, you find three things. Number one, if, we'll start out with the predicate that the myth is busted, but then what replaces it? Because people do grieve. The first thing is that individuality places it, replaces it. Everybody grieves differently. Hmm. There's a lot of differences in the way we grieve, the intensity of the grief, the type of grief, uh, 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 what cultures you're in, your associations with it. It is individually understood. So no one size fits all grief response you can have. Um, the second thing we know is that there are, even though it's all individual and balkanized even, there are some statistical trends that you can show that are behaviorally linked. There turns out that there are three types of grief, and they fall very, very well into the categories individually expressed within those categories. First is what's called uncomplicated grief. This is your grief, your standard grief that you know and love or hate, but you are familiar with. Mm. It's the grief that people go through. It's uncomplicated. It's horrible. It's the worst thing most people go through, but it is also uncomplicated. There is the second type of grief that's called complicated grief or complex grief. Uh, it used to be called stuck grief, and I'll tell you why. People that are in complicated grief are still grieving 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later. The 15th year of their grief looks just like the first year. They mm. appear to have gotten stuck. They appear to have gotten, it's, uh, it's become more complicated. Probably historically, the best example is Queen Victoria back in the days of uh, when, her, when her dearly beloved uh, spouse, Prince Albert, died. She stayed in black the rest of her life, even though she would, derain, she would reign for many more decades, never seeming to come over uh, complicated uh, her grief. And that's called complicated grief. And then finally, there's a third one called disenfranchised grief. And that is a little bit more like survivor's guilt grief where you go through, oh, you, I've, I've had some horrible things happen, but people have had a lot more horrible things happen than I. Why am I feeling this way? Mm -hmm. The idea of survivor's guilt is a form of the grief also. So there's, there's that. All right. With all that in mind, we can talk about what are the things that can be done. The answer is it fully depends upon how you're grieving to show you that even within these categories where there's individuality and there's several different types and there's a, a, a timeline that, that goes with most of them. Some people are stuck. Some people are not. It's still really individual. 
For example, I know one person that her, whose mother died. She was close to her mother, and she just collapsed, fell apart, as you should. That I would call uh, healthy grief. You are grieving. Because, but there is a, a, a story somebody told me once of a, 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 of a woman whose mother also died, and she was the kind of the can-do person that would just take charge of it. And she did. She took charge of the funeral, made sure that there was a, a wake afterward and all these kinds of things. Ten years, 14 years passed by. And then the following happened, Stephen. This woman, this dear, responsible daughter, wakes up one morning. She had a parakeet. She goes in to feed the parakeet, finds the parakeet on the floor of the cage because the parakeet died that night. She looks at the parakeet and says, my parakeet has died just like my mom. Boom. Then she goes, it is as individual as that. Mm -hmm. um, the timeline usually goes for uncomplicated grief. The four to six months is usually the hell months. It's the, usually the toughest part. The, uh, within the next two years, the next 24 months, uh, you're busy visiting the anniversaries of all the times during the year when you were with someone and they were, and so you're still re responding. Most people don't have what is sometimes called integration events where you have integrated the death, integrated the loss until about year four. So, mm -hmm. and even then, it's not usually if the person really meant something to you, you have just learned to live with it. It's, it's, it's so you're in, integrating is a good word as opposed to stamping it down or feeling uh, it often it gets replaced eventually with feelings and nostalgia, but not for a long time. And if that's the case, the workplace of the future needs to deal with the fact that a whole bunch of people are going to be coming back into the office walking wounded. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. Coming back with a with a psychological force behind them that they have spent most of the time in their own homes, busy grieving by themselves. And when they come back to work and they see somebody else who's also grieving, uh, a, a powerful article published in the in Wired. This is pre COVID, I believe, uh, talking about that twenty five percent grief. Uh, what some offices nobody accommodated this because we hide grief under the rug, but some uh, some office mates eventually created something that's called a, a weeping path, <laughs> a weeping path, a place where they could go and a way to get there where they could go back and be by themselves and just fall apart. Mm -hmm. Maybe a storeroom underneath a stairwell or something. But it got to be known as you know, uh, oh, this is where you go when you need to fall apart. The uh, um, I think that should be institutionalized in the modern business world. I think we should create and and offices of the future should have formal weeping paths and understand that when people are sitting at their cubicle at their office and then all of a sudden they seem to fall apart for no good reason, that there's a really good reason. Sure. Mm -hmm. They're grieving and that that needs to be. I fully get it that an office is not supposed to be a counselor's chamber. And I totally understand for therapy purposes. Nonetheless. Grief is a normal part of the human experience. And if we're starting to talk about how to optimize the workplace of the future, the office for the best schedule, one of the biggest thing is take account of the fact that you deal with human beings when they come back and that some of those human beings have suffered catastrophic loss. Mm. Well, I just, it, it just, you know, I, I, I want to take that last thing that you said there where, you know, maybe the workplace isn't a counselor's chamber or anything like that, but at the same time, one of the hallmarks of our culture. And when we say all our culture, I'm saying, you know, we're both Americans. We come from, you know, that, that sort of Western, you know, low context, you know, kind of stuff. Sure. Sure. One of our failings as we've, I'll call it a failing that we have, we have, we are now discovering over the last five, 10, 15 years is that we try to be septic. We try to be clinical about how we, I was like, look, you're at work now. There's yeah. a different person. There's a different personality that comes. And I'm going to, I'm going to extrapolate this to the learning environment too, right? In, in a university or in a school, like, Hey, suddenly, you know, Hey, you're here to learn and this is who you're supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. I love that you've put it on the table and it's like, wait, we, you know, we, we need to acknowledge, prepare for, have outlets for, and actually celebrate. Let's yeah. use that word that we're humans. We're complex. We are life doesn't stop because the, you know, because yeah. you're on the clock. Well, we're yeah. also ridiculously relational humans. But yeah, you brought us right back. Perfect. And we, maybe we can close with this. The, <laughs> we survived the Serengeti. Like I said, you know, look at your incisors. I mean, this yeah. doesn't do well against a, a mouse. Look at your claws, right? I mean, this doesn't get well against paper. Hey, look at your endoskeleton. I mean, we are just this weak, wimpy one. We, we conquered the world because we could do something magic. We grew our fangs on the inside. Mm-hmm. 
and we grew our claws on the inside. We learned that we could double our biomass, not by waiting millions of years to double our biomass, but simply by changing a few neurons in here over several hundred thousand years so that we could learn to cooperate, so mm -hmm. that we could learn to have the concept that is virtually foreign to every other animal, social animal that exists right now, and that is we could create the concept of friend. Mm -hmm. And that relationship, the ability to coordinate, to cooperate with our behavior with people that were pro-social towards us and that we were pro-social to, that they were friends with, meant that they would have my back if, if needed and I would have their back if, if needed. All of a sudden, we doubled our biomass in a few hundred thousand years, not by doubling our biomass at all, but by creating the concept of friend and ally. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, relationships lie at the heart of everything we are. And to think you can ignore that hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary history simply because you've got some freaking spreadsheet that you want to optimize to, means you know almost nothing about the workers that are trying to build that spreadsheet. Mm. Nice. Man, that is such a... It, it, I, I want to tie it in a bow right there, but now I've talked about it now so many times that I have to make good on the promise of... So if we know that 90 minutes is the thing, we know that you got to take a break and we know that, you know, the big head piece and, you know, all, all these other things. Right. Um, what's what's the ideal schedule for a learning institution or a workplace or just an individual? What what you've told me this before, but I'd love for you to tell everybody who's listening. <laughs> Well, I think one of the best things you can do is that you can optimize the individuality of the learners that are occurring so that you would, if, if you're in a learning space, optimal is probably one to five. I know mm -hmm. that's not realistic. And I, could, I couldn't give a rip. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so extraordinarily important. And it would be in person one to five that you would have tremendous amounts of relationships that are developing between a mentor and the people that are around. I think the Oxford model, which is based on, a little bit on the Socratic idea of walking through the forest and, and, and answering and asking questions, that would be the first thing I would do. I would, so I would get rid of the whole concept of we're all going to gather together in one place. I won awards for my teaching in times past, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm good at it, but I am actually putting lipstick on a pig. This, I look at those kids and I know what I'm going to have to do to teach them something about the molecular biology of psychiatric disorders. But I know that they need a break for me in 90 minutes, that they need to have a nap, which we didn't talk about, probably about three o'clock in the afternoon, that they need to figure out what their chronotype is. I know some of my colleagues are late chronotypes and get them over there. <laughs> <laughs> I would create the individuality that their brains suggest need to happen as the first thing in instituting a, 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 a an institution wide change. Mm, fantastic. Dr. John Medina, thank you so very much for being on the show today. This has been not only a treat, but uh, you know, an absolute trove of, of data and ideas and, and wonderfulness. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with us. And I hope that we'll get to talk to you again sometime. Well, you're a patient listener and thank you very much for asking me to come on.